Previously on Coramdale. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. He then takes a jar of oil and he pours it over a rock. That every time he would pass that stone, he would remember the experience that he had with God and the promises that God made to him and the promises that he made to God. See, we know these stories later on. We know 2,000 years later that in Hebrews it talks about the, the hall of fame of faith, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But that hadn't been written yet. So far, he was just the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac. And it was like, what's up, Jake? It don't matter that you were raised in a Christian home and your mom and dad went to church and did the cross every day. Do you know him? That's when the whole thing shifts. He says, you will be my God. He's like, I'm in awe that God would choose me to impact my community, to impact my generation, to impact the world. And I asked you last week to, to pray and come up with a word that 2020 meant to you. Do you have some promises of God that you are standing on for 2020. There's thankfulness when you can look back at what God did, but there's passion and commitment and drive and motivation when you have a word for what God's going to do. Circumstance hasn't changed. His environment hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is his awareness of God. And I'm telling you today, just because you don't feel God, just because you're not hearing God, does not mean that God's not there. Could it be that God is shouting your name, but you're not attuned to it? And we're gonna continue with that same momentum this week. We're talking about Coram Deo. You heard it up on the screen. It's the title of this series. It's a Latin phrase meaning in the presence of God. The actual literal translation means before the eyes of God. And maybe you were raised either in a religious home or had a religious grandmother or grandfather and they said things like, you better be careful, God's watching you. And it was a scary thing, like God's trying to punish you for the bad stuff that you've done. And what God's really saying is, I see you, I'm here to help. I'm with you. Would you invite me in? Would you invite me to be part of your decision-making processes? And, and it never needed to be a scary thing. We just used it to, like, control people, right? Today, we're going to talk about uh, the ending of the story here in Genesis 28. It's been our key text for this series. And in Genesis 28, 18, it says this. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone that he had placed under his head and set it as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. That's what we did last week. That was the whole uh, ceremonial thing that we did coming through. The stone is over there. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the stone that he used as a pillow was a little bit smaller than that, uh, or else his neck would have been kinked. But watch what it says here. He called the place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz, L-U-Z, Luz. Today, I'm asking the question, have you ever found yourself in Loserville? Have you ever found yourself in Loserville? And by Loserville, I mean L-O-S-E-R, loser. You're a loser. You feel like you're losing. You feel like you're not getting ahead. You're not feeling like a champion. You're feeling like the odds are against you. You feel like all the mistakes you made are compiling to this moment of your life and anxiety and things are trying to overtake you because you're in Loserville. We've all gone through times in our lives that we didn't feel like winners. Huh? Maybe you didn't quite feel like a loser, but you definitely weren't winning. You didn't feel like a champion. And so for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about winning. Is that all right? Amen. Winning. Winning, all right? And why do we want to talk about winning? Put this up on the screen. Because winning is better than not winning. Huh? Can I get an amen? Somebody. 
Winning is better than not winning. I got to tell you, I am highly competitive. How many people in here are highly competitive? Okay. How many people in here are not competitive at all? Like if competition comes, you're like, nope, count me out. Yeah? Okay. I don't understand people like that. But I will try to comprehend, or I will try to work with you today. I am highly competitive. I can turn anything into a race, a contest, or a competition at any time, right? And, and partly it's because of the way I was raised. I blame my mother, really. My mother had a way of manipulating me to do things that she wanted me to do. She would say, Mike, let me see how fast you can run upstairs... Get me a glass of water with ice, a little sprinkle of lemon, and bring it back downstairs. Ready? One, two, three. And I would take off running as fast as I could, make her this ice water with her lemon spritzer just the way she wanted it, just about break my neck, coming back down the stairs. And then she's like, oh, six, seven. Oh, you did great, 10 seconds. Huh? Later I realized I was being manipulated. But I was competitive. I wanted to beat the time, right? I set goals for myself. And in order to accomplish those goals, I, I, I get other people in on a competition, right? If I want to lose weight, it's got to be a contest. If I want to read a certain number of books, it's a contest. Let's see how many people can read X amount of books. Let's see how many people, all right, let's do an ab challenge. Let's have abs by summertime. Who's with me? And then we'll do some kind of competition for it, right? And if you're sitting, up there, sitting there today and you're like, this guy's lost his mind, I'll be honest. I'm not always happy with myself that I'm as competitive as I am. I'll be honest. Um, I, I do not do competitive sports today. To this day, I don't do competitive sports because um, sometimes during competitive sports, I don't act like a pastor. <laughs> and in order to protect my salvation, <laughs> I choose not to be part of competitive sports. Right? It does. It bothers me. It bothers me how... How aggressive I get playing sports. My, my oldest daughter played high school softball, and after her first game, she said, Daddy, please don't ever come to another one of my games. <laughs> because I was competitive for her. She was playing in the outfield, and I couldn't just sit in the bleachers. I had to walk down the fence to the outfield to where she's at. I'm like, all right, baby, they're going to hit the ball, so you got to get ready. Get the ball! And I wasn't angry at her. I was just into it like, hustle, get the ball, second base, second base, second base. <laughs> I have this need to win that others don't. And I really, I do, I try to understand that. Um, I don't play golf. I don't play golf to this day. My dad loves playing golf. If you ever want to take somebody out to play golf, take Pastor Joe, Pastor Mike Martz, Pastor Earl, one of those guys. But don't take me. Don't take me golfing. Because I'm not good at it. And that makes me angry. Because I can't blame anybody for me not being good. You know, when you play a team sport, you can say, man, it's just Johnny. Johnny can't kick the ball. But in golf, it's, I can't hit the ball. I can't make that little ball. And so instead of it being relaxing and enjoyable, I'm straight happy Gilmore. I'm breaking clubs. I'm throwing stuff. I'm growing as a leader. But maybe you're not, maybe you're not competitive, but there is one area that we all need to feel like we're winning. We all need to feel that we're winning in life. Are you winning in life. Is life a win for you or do you currently feel like you're in Loserville? Do you currently feel like you're not getting ahead, like you've already run your weight race and now you're done and now you're waiting for something else to happen but you don't know what's supposed to happen and so you feel like you're not contributing? There, just because you're not winning doesn't mean you have to be in Loserville but for some reason, 
a lot of times we believe we are. Many of us can't answer the question. We can't answer the question if we're winning in life because we don't know what the rules are. We don't know what the rules are to life. How am I supposed to play this game? So my son, he's six years old. He's now in, I guess it's like peewee, peewee league soccer. He's in soccer. And he's pretty, good at, he's pretty good at it. But my son has no idea what the rules are. He has no idea what he's doing out there except run and kick the ball. Right? So I'm like, okay, Poppy, listen. And I'm, I'm, I'm like trying to coach him. I'm like, listen, Poppy. You're on defense, which means that you have to defend this side. And, and he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And so then he runs out on the field, and all, and all of a sudden the, the game goes, and I look over at my son, and he's like this. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. <laughs> son, pay attention. And he was like, ah. <laughs> Yo, I'm not joking. I'm, not, I'm serious. I'm embarrassed. Because I got him in all umbro gear. He's geared out. He's got the sneakers that match the jumpsuit. I'm geared out. We're matching like I'm in this with him. And so then like the ball comes on his side. I'm like, get him out. Get him out. I'm serious. And we're in like a tiny little gym, like six of us. Everybody's looking at me. I'm serious. But they don't know what the rules are. They don't know what the rules are. And because, because they don't know what the rules are, when the ball comes them, they don't know what to do. Five of them on the same team. Same team kicking it at each other, stealing the ball from each other. And I'm like, you're on the same team. I feel like yelling that at the church sometimes when we're gossiping about each other. We're talking negatively about each other. When, when, when we can't rejoice for someone who got the promotion, but, the, but they're supposed to be a Christian too, and I'm, we're on the same team! There's one kid, he's a little bit bigger than everybody else. He can kick the ball across the whole gym. He gets the ball, and he doesn't know what to do, so he just kicks it straight back. He's facing the wrong way. I'm like, bro, you're going the wrong way. You're trying to score on your own goal. I wonder if the Holy Spirit, when we're making wrong decisions, is ever screaming at us, you're going the wrong way. But we don't hear it. We don't hear it. And we're playing this game of life. And I say, are you winning? He's like, I don't know, because I don't know what the rules are. I don't know what the rules are. See, many of us, we can't tell if we're winning. We can't tell if we're headed in the right direction, because we don't know what a win is. What's the win? What's the purpose? What's the goal? It's funny, I can sit down and watch sports with some people and they have no idea what football is and they say, oh, is that a home run? <laughs> Wrong sport. Wrong sport, right? But when, but, when, but, when, but when we're watching other people's lives, so, oh, is that a win? Is, is that the win I'm supposed to be going after? See, because if you don't identify your win, someone else will define it for you. If you don't identify your win, someone else will define it for you. And I'm going to tell you, it's probably going to be someone's social media feed that defines your win that's not supposed to be your win. We get caught up in this cycle of, of comparison and we compare someone else's highlight reel to our behind the scenes. Someone's posting a picture of their vacation, 
vacation of a lifetime. Me and my wife, we're so happy to be on this vacation. Smoochy, smoochy, smoochy faces. What you don't know is that she served him divorce papers on the trip. But you're so upset. Look at them. They're always on vacation. All over this. And I'm sitting here and I'm working so hard. I can't even afford a vacation like that. I wish I was on a vacation like that. My husband can't provide a vacation like that. Neither can they. It's going to take them five years in credit card debt to pay that vacation off. But we're letting people define what a win is by a picture that's been photoshopped and filtered. And we're trying to run what God is saying to us through someone else's filter. Ain't going to work. It ain't going to work like that. If you don't identify your wins, someone else will define it for you. Let's take a look at Jacob. Jacob, in this passage, Jacob is the son of Isaac, who is the son of Abraham. Right? Maybe you don't have any church background. This is all foreign to you. But maybe you've heard of Father Abraham, right? Maybe, maybe that's enough. You've heard that, Abraham. There's a song, Father Abraham had many sons. It's old children's ministry. And many sons had Father Abraham. You got to move your arm. I am one of them. And so we, so let, anyway. <laughs> Abraham is like the father of faith. He had a covenant with God. He was of the pure bloodline, this relationship with God. And he passes that on to his son, Isaac, and then there's Jacob. Jacob's grandfather is a winner. Jacob's father is a winner. But Jacob's born a loser. Jacob's a twin. But he's not the first twin. He's the second one to come out. He's the second one to come out. Say, okay, so what? Well, only the firstborn gets the birthright. Only the firstborn gets the family blessing. So at best, Jacob is born the first place loser. He's born in second place. That's not not good enough because there's something inside of him that he says, I want to win. And I'll do anything I have to, to win. And so one day... His father's getting old, his eyesight is dimming, and along with his mom, they come up with a plan. They're going to deceive Isaac into giving him the family blessing. Now, the family blessing is Esau's. What we have to understand is that Jacob has already blackmailed his brother, his brother's dying of starvation. He says, well, if you want some of this stew that I made, give me the birthright. And the brother's like, well, what would it it mean to me to have a birthright if I'm going to die of starvation so you can have it? So he's already stolen the birthright. Now he's devised a plan with his mom to steal the family blessing. He goes and he puts fur on his arms. He gets one of Esau's outfits, puts it on, and he goes in with some stew to his dad. He says, I'm ready for the blessing. And the dad's like, wow, that was really fast. How did you go and get an animal and cook it? He goes, ah, you know, the Lord was with me. I, I, I did really well. He says, you feel like Esau, but your voice is of Jacob. Come here. And as he comes close, Isaac smells him, and he says, well, you smell like Esau. You smell like the outside. All right, and he gives him the blessing. As Jacob's walking out of the room with the family blessing, Esau comes walking in the house with his kill, ready to make the stew for his father to get the blessing. And Esau bugs out. He's like, is it not good enough that you stole the birthright, now you took my blessing too. And, and Esau runs and he says, Father, is there any blessing left for me? And he said, no, I gave it all to your brother. I gave it all away. And Esau is angry. And here's the Pastor Mike translation. He says this, when dad dies, you die. 
when dad dies, Jacob, you die. I will kill you for what you did. So Jacob, full of fear, runs for his life. Run. Now. He's out. He just runs, takes over the run. Gone. I was a little scared doing that. I thought someone was going to pull out a gun and shoot at him. You didn't know what's going on right now. <laughs> you were all so scared. Woo! He runs for his life. But in order to leave properly, he has to have a reason to leave. So him and his mom, Jacob and his mom, devise another plan. They create a whole nother plan. They say, listen, we're going to tell your father that, that you can't marry a Canaanite woman. What? The ugly. <laughs> Canaanite women are ugly. We can't have an ugly one in the family. Seriously. Seriously, it wasn't that ugly. I just made that up. So we're going to devise a plan that you can't marry a Canaanite woman, so you need to go away to find a wife. So he comes in and says, Dad, I'm about to leave. I'm going to go find a wife. Deception after deception after deception. And this looks like a pattern in Jacob's life. Trying to win, but feeling like a loser. Trying to win, doing whatever he can do to win, but inside knowing that he's violating something within him to win, and it lands him in lose. It lands him in loserville. He's running from a list of bad decisions. He's running from people he's hurt. He's run from things that he's done that's hurt himself. I wonder if you can identify with him today. I wonder if you can identify with having the belief that if I just get one win, it'll make me feel so much better about all my losses. Because this is what he's trying to do. He's trying to win, but he's feeling defeated. He's been deceiving and lying. And here's really the part that I don't understand. God honors it. God honors the blessing that Isaac put on his son by deception. Watch, we're gonna get to this, we're gonna look at this, right? Genesis 28, 13. This is when Jacob is having this vision, he's having this dream, and this is what God says. There above stood the Lord, and he said to them, I am the Lord. He's speaking to him. I am your, I'm the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land in which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. Watch. I will not leave you, Coram Deo, until I have done what I have promised you. Pastor Mike, this doesn't seem fair. How can he do all this bad stuff and still be blessed? I don't know. How can God still bless you? How can we still be blessed today? It's easy for us to read a story and be like, this is not fair. You're right. It's not. It's not fair. But I don't know where Christianity ever made us believe that God was fair. Ooh, it got quiet a bit. It's not fair. It's not fair that one person has to take the sin of the world upon themselves. It's not fair that him who knew no sin became sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's not fair. It's not fair that God had to lose a son in heaven to come to earth to take on my decisions on his body. So as much as we want to look back and say, God's not fair, you're right, he isn't. But he's just and he's loving. 
and he's always there. See, see, see the problem is we want to also take on Esau's offense. Well, if that ever happened to me, I'd want to kill him too. Mm -hmm. do, you know what, do you know what Isaac said to Esau? He says, I don't have a blessing for you, but I will tell you this. As long as you live with the offense, you will live by, by the dust of the ground. You'll just get by. But when you let go of the offense, the noose or the, or the, or the, the, the weight will be lifted off your shoulders. This is the promise that he says to his son. What, what we don't know is that, because we don't really read the stories out, finally one day, Jacob and Esau meet back up. They meet back up. And it says that Esau has to ask his entourage to stay back because he doesn't want his brother to fear that he's coming to kill him. Esau forgave his brother, and he had so many descendants. He was so blessed and so rich because he forgave his brother. So as much as we want to sit back and be upset for somebody, don't. 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 Know that God wants to bless you even though we don't deserve it. God wants to bless you too, right? God honors the blessings of Isaac, and then he places his own blessing on Jacob. But Jacob knows inside of himself he doesn't deserve it. He knows he doesn't deserve it. He's living with this guilt. He's living with this shame that I don't deserve these kind of blessings. I just want to tell you this. I don't care what you've been through. God wants to bless you. I don't care what kind of shame that you've carried around. God wants to bless you. Before God begins to work on you, though, before God begins to do a work through you, he wants to give you a vision of where you're going. God wants to give you a vision of where you're going. So Jacob finds himself in a, in a city called Luz, right? Luz, L-U-Z. The word Luz literally means almond tree, okay? Almond tree. Almond trees are known for their crooked and, and their weird-looking branches. So some theologians believe that this area is called Luz because of the amount of almond trees that are in that area. Some theologians believe that the area is named Luz because of the people that live there, their lifestyles resemble that of crooked branches. That they were a crooked and perverse people. That, that, the, that the Canaanites, the people that inhabited that area, had begun to adopt the previous people, Sodom and Gomorrah that they begin to take on that same kind of perversion in their own city. All of us, you gotta understand this, all of us before Christ were from Loserville. Crooked and perverse. I don't care how good you've lived your life. I don't care how good you think you've lived your life, that you've lived so good that you deserve heaven, that pride right there disqualifies you from it. That's called self-righteousness, means you don't need a savior. Can't do it. Can't do it, right? I believe that God gave us this passage to show us the kind of person that this church is supposed to reach. I'm not calling Middletown Loserville, not at all. What I'm saying is, is that I believe that God's called us to reach a people that don't look like church people. I believe that God's called us to reach a tattoo generation, a pierced generation, a scarred generation, a skinny jean generation, <laughs> a hurt and broken generation, a generation that's not looking for God. They're looking for community. They're looking for acceptance. Come on, I can accept somebody, but not approve of their lifestyle. Come on, you got to understand something here, right? They're, they're looking for community, they're looking for family, they're looking for fun. And when they come to family church, they'll get all that, and then we'll introduce them to Jesus. 
We're called to reach a generation that's looking for their next high. But what they really need is the most high. Amen. Come on. Generation looking for their next fix. But they need the fixer. Come on. God's not holding a past against you. He desires more than anything that you win in life. But listen, but we must first define the win. What is the win? What is the touchdown? What is a home run for your life? Now, I could sit up here today and I could give you all sorts of examples of what wins could be, but that would be too easy for you. Because all you would then do is adopt one of the ones I say. Your journey in life is to discover the win for yourself. Discover that win for yourself. Last week, we defined our year. We named it. We set a goal. We made a promise. We even placed a reminder in the room. But next, your next step, we're all about our next steps, is to change your name. You got to change your name. Now, before you think I'm about to do something really weird and cultish, and I call everybody up and say, okay, you're Bobby, you're Sally, you're Susie, you're John, you're Jeff, you're Nick, you're Sally. All right, we're not going to do that. We're not going to give you a christening name. We're not doing all that. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about today is you need to change the name you call yourself. You need to change the name you call yourself. You're not dumb. Stop calling yourself dumb. I'm fat. Stop calling yourself fat. I'm ugly. Stop calling yourself ugly. I'm a loser. Stop calling yourself a loser. We got to change the name, the nicknames, the tag names, the things that other people have placed on us, the names that we've placed on ourselves. Did I mention what Jacob's name meant? Jacob's name meant supplanter. Supplanter means one who wrongfully or illegally seizes and holds the place of another. His name meant you're going to steal somebody's place. You're going to steal the birthright. You're going to steal the blessing. It also means heel grabber. When Esau came out as first, Jacob was holding his brother's heel. He was always trying to supplant. He was always trying to win. He always wanted to get ahead, but not getting ahead. So many theologians believe that because of what he did and, and the name supplanter, they call him Jacob the deceiver. And guess what he did? He lived up to his name. And you keep living up to the name that you give yourself. You're living up to the name that you give yourself. Jacob the deceiver is not a positive name. He's carrying a name based on losing, based on failure, not winning. It wasn't a winner name. But God won't leave him that way. God won't leave him there. God ain't going to leave you with your loser lesser self. God's not going to leave you with this name that you keep calling yourself. And listen, let me just say something, because there's some people in here who are a little bit older than me, a lot of bit older than me, really, really a lot older than me. <laughs> and you're saying to yourself, well, Mike, it's too late for me. Are you still breathing? You still got a pulse? Come on, let's get a win under your belt. Let's get a win under your belt. Right? Check this out. Just a few chapters later, we were in chapter 28. Let's jump to 32. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of day. It was actually an angel of the Lord. Okay? Now when he saw that he could not prevail, when the, when the angel saw that he could not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip and knocked it out of the socket. Ow! That's pain, man. I dislocated my shoulder, and my shoulder had popped out. It was like hanging there. Pain! Right? Knocks his hip out of joint, and he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Jacob says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. He said to him, what's your name? He says, what's your name? Jacob. Not today. 
Not today. Your name shall no longer be called deceiver. Your name shall no longer be called supplanter. Your name shall no longer be called your failure, your mistakes, your past. Watch. He says, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with man, and you won. And you won. And you won. We got to stop identifying with the loss. And change our name to a win. Change the name to a win. Got to stop telling yourself you're a slow reader. I'm a slow reader. Can I tell you something about me? I'm going to be vulnerable for a minute. Don't judge me. In school, I was in special needs reading. Right? Special needs reading. I had to leave the big classroom and go with like five other kids to the small classroom. I knew it wasn't cool. I knew I wasn't in a room with all the popular kids. In my mind, I was in the dumb class. I was in the dumb class. I can't read. That was my name. I can't read. I have a reading problem. I mix up the words. I can't comprehend it. I can't understand it. I can't retain it. And so I lived my life in a way that would then justify the fact that I was dumb. If I needed good grades, I cheated. I cheated. I just looked at this. I always sat next to the smart kid in class. Duh. I was that smart. I was smart enough to know that. But I believed I couldn't read. And that really wasn't true. I just didn't want to read the dumb books that the school wanted me to read. Right? I didn't care about the stuff they wanted me to read. I wanted to read my own stuff. I could take a car manual, and I could read the car manual and take a motor apart and put it back together. I could do that because it was something that interested me. But I labeled myself dumb. You can't read. Slow reader. And then when people would ask me, hey, did you ever read XYZ book? No, no, I'm a slow reader. No, no, I'm not a reader. And so it was so hard for me to get into the discipline of reading because it was against my identity. I'm going to help somebody here today. Somebody in here today, you've been trying to quit smoking. You've been trying to quit smoking cigarettes. And so when someone says, hey, you want to smoke? You say, no, 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 no. I'm trying to quit. And that's why you're not quitting. Because your identity is, I am a smoker who's trying to quit. You're not getting this yet. You're not, you're not seeing this yet. Instead of when someone offers you a smoke, no, no, thank you, I'm not a smoker. You have to change the identity before you change the behavior. The problem is we're all walking around and holding on to these broken identities, trying to change a behavior that we never can. Because we have the wrong name. I realized this year, the beginning of this year, why it's been so hard for me to get back in the gym. I'm like, man, why can't I motivate myself to get back in the gym? It's because when people ask me, hey, are you working out? I say, no, no, no. I used to be a bodybuilder. For seven years, I was a bodybuilder. Right? I was in the gym seven days a week, an hour and a half, two hours a day. I used to be this. But now I have no health identity anymore. I used to say I'm a gym rat, but I'm not that anymore. So I can't, I've been having this hard time motivating myself to get back in the gym because I lost the gym rat identity. I lost the bodybuilder identity. It's time to change the name. It's time to change the name. It's time to get rid of the looser, lesser lesser self name. The loser, lesser self name. We got to kick the name. You kick the name, you kick the habit. Whoo, write that down. You kick the name, you kick the habit. Why? Listen, when I set a goal, right, when I'm I'm looking at books, like I have this goal this year that I want to read 24 books this year, okay? That's my goal. My goal isn't to read a book. My goal is to become a reader. My goal is to change an identity. I'm a reader. I'm a reader. Today, I consume books. 
Today I sit down and I can read a book in a day. But if I held on to the other name, I wouldn't do it. Here's what I know. Big idea today. Your behaviors are usually a reflection of your identity. Your behaviors are usually a reflection of your identity. What you think about yourself, you will behave that way. You'll behave that way. You'll do it. Oh, I'm just, I just, I'm just addicted to chocolate. You'll eat tons of chocolate, right? I'm just, I'm, I'm such a sugar addict. See, back in my parents' time, they say you have what you say. The confession of your mouth, you have it. The truth is, you believe it, and what you believe about yourself is the way you will behave, right? You will prove it, just like Jacob. I'm going to prove my name. Change the name, change the course of your life. As we get ready to go back into uh, singing two more songs, we're going to close out today with two more songs. We have a communion station available right here if you'd like to take communion today. The Quorum Deo Rock is up here. If you didn't get a chance to do that, you can do that during worship. As this year rolls out, uh, at the end of our service, as, as we do songs, you're free to get out of your seats at any time. Come to the front, come to one of the stations, and, and worship God in your own way. But I have homework for you today. Homework for you, all right? Something I want you to do this week. I want you to take some time during your quiet time, during your meditation time, during if, if you do yoga or stretching or, or, or you're in the shower or, or prayer time, whatever you want to call your time, and search yourself. Do an inventory. Is there something in my life, is there a name I keep calling myself that's blocking me from moving forward? I'm going to say something real quick, and I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings. But what happened to you when you were a child can't keep affecting your tomorrow. At some point, at some point, you became stronger than that, but you kept holding on to the label. You became stronger than the situation. You became stronger than the person that hurt you, but you're still holding on to the label. You got to let it go. You got to let it go. And I know that counseling is great. And I know seeing therapists are great. And I know going in there and, and pulling up what those things are and identifying them are great. But until you put that thing to rest and move forward with a new name, you'll never fulfill the, the goals and the, and the passions and the desires that are in your heart that God put there. You got to change the name. Rename it. Rename that thing. What, what the enemy meant as a stumbling block, what the enemy put in your life to take you out, God wants to use as a stepping stone to put you into your future. Yeah. If you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to step into the Christian belief system, the, the relationship with Jesus Christ, we want to offer that to you today. And we don't do that in any, in any weird way, but, but if you know that there's just something in your life that, that is just not clicking, you've been searching for the answer to life, the meaning of life, some joy in, in all different realms, but you haven't found it, I'm telling you, I know you weren't looking for God, but that's the answer. That's the answer. Jesus Christ, he's the answer. He fills the void. He fills the longing that nothing else can. And we'd love to invite you into this family, this community of believers. And we all pray a prayer together. And it goes like this, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Could I take two seconds and, and just celebrate somebody? If you prayed that for the very first time, could you just wave at me for like one second? I just want to celebrate somebody. Anybody here today? Yeah, man, I see you. Anybody else? Over here, yeah, I see you. I like that hair. Anybody else? Over here, awesome. Good to see you. Amen. Welcome home. Welcome home.
there's, a, there's some information on the seat back in front of you. There's a, a book called Starting Point at the high top tables in the back. It's a little devotional that helps you start your first week as a new believer, and that's available to you in the back. As we get ready to, to, to sing these two, two songs, we want to continue this worship moment by presenting our tithe and our offering to God. It, it, it's, it's our way of supporting what God is doing. If you're watching online, you can be part of this giving moment as well. We have multiple giving options that should be up on the screen behind me uh, now, maybe. And so you can participate in this. And, and, and as we keep building this worship moment, we, we pray, our heart is that maybe singing isn't your thing, but you could worship God by taking communion. Maybe communion and singing is not your thing and you'd like to go over and say a prayer at, at, the, at, at the, I don't even know what we're calling that. We're not calling it a pillar, but the stone to recommit what you're doing for the year. We've got two more stations coming that we want to add to this worship experience. And again, it's not, it's not that we're trying to go back to tradition or ceremonies or anything weird. It's just that we all worship God differently and we come in here with different needs week to week. But we know that if we don't take time to worship God, then we're not going to have Coram Deo. We're not going to have the presence of God if we don't ever take some time and say, Lord, I'm here. Speak to me. Maybe it's during this moment that God's going to give you that word, that name that needs to change, that thing in your life that, that needs to go in order for you to move forward. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to sow into your kingdom. We present our tithe and our offering to you. We pray that you use it for your kingdom, for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen.